Hi there. Good morning. You guys can all hear me all right, yeah? My name is Katrina Shrebny, and I work for the acoustics group here at Ramble. The acoustics group is a reasonable size. There's about 50 acousticians worldwide. I started working at Ramble two and a half years ago when the acoustics team expanded to the UK. What is exciting about this project, Hornsey Road Baths, for me, is that Hornsey Road Baths was the first project I worked on when we started the UK acoustics group. While my team has been keeping busy with new academies, schools, and commercial developments, we've noticed a trend toward the refurbishment of old spaces. We've had a couple of projects, for instance, where old churches are being refurbished into multi-use performance spaces and concert halls. Hornsey Road Baths is an example of something similar to that, where an old Victorian bath has been transformed into a new youth performance space and community center. During the next 20 minutes, I'll give a brief introduction to the project and history of the building, go through design and client aspirations, explain the key issues for good acoustics, and finish off with the results and conclusions. Hornsey Road runs north-south in Islington in London. The Victorian baths are located not far from Finsbury Park. In 2009, funding became available through the My Place scheme to convert this laundry into a multi-purpose and flexible performance space for young people. There are something like close to 200 bids for this project, and the winning architect were, architects were Van Hanegan and Howard, or VHH, who approached us to do the acoustic design work. So this picture here shows the front of Hornsey Road Baths. Hornsey Road runs this way, and the entrance to the building is through the gatehouse through here. So looking at it from the other side, Hornsey Road would be running along here. And you walk in through here, and the entrance is over here. As you walk in, there's now a cafe on the left-hand side. And then going out the building over here, we have some uh, media suites, meeting rooms. There's also a recording studio. This part over here is a staircase. And then coming around this side of the building, we have two multi-purpose performance spaces. This is the upper ground performance space and the basement performance space. And then over in this building, we have a dance studio on the ground floor. So to set the scene, 19th century London was a very dirty place. The population was exp expanding at a tremendous rate from around 1 million people in 1800 to close to 7 million people in 1900. In doing a bit of research for the stock, I learned that in the early 1800s, nude bathing was a continual problem and police officers were often called upon to stop it. Clearly, there is a problem for all these dirty people. And so, to deal with the lack of washing areas, in 1846, the Public Baths and Wash Houses Act uh, received royal assent. This allowed local authorities to construct swimming baths. 30 years later, the Public Works Loan Act was passed, and this actually gave the local authorities the money to build this, the baths. Um, and so, in 1895, Hornsey Road Baths was complete, and it soon became a popular spot for Victorians to get cleaned up. <coughs> the facility hosted four swimming pools, 125 slipper baths, which are foot baths, um, a wash house, and a laundry. It was also a venue for meetings, exercise, boxing, and apparently concerts were also held. During the Second World War, um, parts of the building were damaged by bombing. The destroyed parts were rebuilt in the mid-1960s, and then it was reopened. During the 1990s recession, the baths were closed for good and left derelict. For the last decade, there have been, been several regeneration projects. Um, in the area, and different parts have been refurbished into things like apartments and offices. As I mentioned earlier, in July 2009, VHH approached Ramble Acoustics to join their team in converting um, the disused laundry building and gatehouse into a performing arts venue and meeting place for young people in Islington. In July 2011, Platform, which is what it was renamed, um, opened as the new performance space at Hornsey Road Baths. 
people working on this project are listed here. Cushman and Wakefield were the project managers. VHH were the architects. Jonathan Hart Associates were the building services engineers. The structural engineers were Clark Bond, and we did the acoustic design, of course. I think this quote does well to describe the aspirations of this project, that it should be a um, youth-led venue offering a fantastic range of creative activities, volunteering, and training for young people. It is also somewhere safe young people can come for any information, advice, and guidance they need. So the original brief was put together with input from close to 400 young people. The space was to be designed primarily for 13 to 19 year olds and to include a range of facilities, a media center, a music studio, two multi-purpose um, performance spaces, cafe, a rehearsal studio. Um, to ensure the facilities were suitable for the end users, meetings were held with young advisors to get their input. One of the requirements was, for example, for all spaces to be able to be used at the same time. To make this possible, we needed to make sure that the sound insulation um, between spaces was sufficient so that people in adjacent spaces were not disturbed. This image here shows Simon, um, who worked for VHH uh, with some of the young advisors. At the onset of the design, there are three key issues raised by the planning officer. The first had to do with building conservation. This is a grade two listed building, which meant that the character of the building had to be retained. The second was sustainability. So sustainable solutions were to be sought wherever possible. And the third issue was noise. As part of the overall development, flats were already constructed adjacent to this building. And the planning officer was very concerned with potential noise breakout particularly if amplified events took place, which they would. The program for this project was relatively tight for what it was. As it was a refurbishment of an old building, there's lots of hidden surprises along the way, which led to the construction taking much longer, nearly six months longer than expected. It was handed over in July of this year, just in time for the two-week opening festival. Going back to the acoustics now, there are four main areas that need to be addressed for good acoustics. The first, or in this type of building, the first is the suppression of noise egress from the building. So this is noise leaving the building, going outside. This is what the planning officer was concerned with. The second is the control of noise transmission between spaces. This is what was essentially in the client brief, so that all spaces could be used at the same time, so sound insulation between spaces. The third is the suitable acoustic conditions within the space to match the use. So this would have to do with um, the room acoustics. So for instance, how long the reverberation time is in a space. And the fourth is the reduction of noise ingress into the building. So this is setting appropriate limits and ensuring that it's not too noisy within the space. Noise ingress and noise egress are primarily controlled um, by the building envelope. A noise survey was carried out to establish the existing background noise levels at the site. Noise egress limits were set based on these measurements. The site was relatively quiet, and it was clear that the control of noise egress from the building would be the dominant factor in determining the sound insulation of the building envelope. Noise ingress, so noise coming in, would then be dealt with automatically. The most critical element of the old building was the roof. Second was, were the windows, and third were the doors. Originally slate on timber rafters and purlins, the roof provided very little sound insulation. A multi-layered boarded roof construction that included a few layers of cementitious boarding and a large air cavity was designed. This extra weight needed to be supported by steel beams in the external masonry. The slate was retained in keeping with the character of the building, and the heavy layers, along with the large cavity, reduced the high internal noise levels to the prescribed low levels near at the nearest residence. Oh, sorry. So you can see um, the roof over here. This is in the upper ground performance space. The second uh, concern were the windows. Should we have a picture of over here? 
Um, the existing single glaze external windows were retained and repaired as necessary, and then secondary double glazing was added with a deep cavity to the inside. The third um, weakness in the building envelope were the doors. Obviously, if there's a single door separating a noise-producing space from a noise-sensitive space, as soon as the door is opened, the sound for the per someone to walk through, the sound will go through with them. So all entrances to noise-producing spaces were lobbied with acoustically rated doors to maintain the integrity of the building envelope. The control of noise transmission between spaces was the next big issue. The thick brick walls, many of which were retained, lend themselves to a good level of sound insulation, which is suitable for many of the spaces. New walls, such as the inner layer of the box and box construction that we had for the recording studio, was uh, constructed out of a dense double layer of plasterboard. The existing concrete slabs before, between floors were thicker than 200 millimeters in some areas, which also provided a good level of sound insulation. Um, the issues that we needed to deal with were the holes in the walls. There were lots of penetrations needed for pipes and cabling. Um, this picture in the middle shows, um, over here, shows the vent that we discovered in the, one of the walls during a site visit that needed to be sealed up. Um, this picture over here of some of the doors shows one of the most common problems with the installation of acoustic doors, and that's that seals must be properly fitted so that light is not visible around the edges, because where there's light um, shining through, there's also sound that can break through. The acoustic design of the music spaces was quite interesting. This is a picture, again, of the upper ground performance space, which is primarily used for things like live music and theater. The pitch of the roof was suitably steep so that we weren't concerned with echoes in the space. Um, slatted timber was installed on all four sides of the walls, and this was to help with diffusion. The idea of increasing the diffusion in a space helps to just, um, get a more even spread of the sound energy within that space. Uh, the reverberation time criterion. So the reverberation time is the amount of time it takes for sound to decay in a space once the source is stopped. In something like um, a big church, you'll have a very long reverberation time of maybe six, seven, eight seconds. In, in, a, um, in a recording studio, you might have a reverberation time of less than half a second. So there's, there's quite a range. The, Criteria for this space we set between 0.8 and 1.2 seconds. And the purpose of this range was to accommodate different activities. When used for drama, it was beneficial for it to be more on the acoustically dead side so that speech could be hear, heard more clearly compared to when it was used for music. And some reverberations can actually make the, the music sound much richer. The curtains at the front of the space can be bunched or deployed as necessary to alter the acoustics. Behind the slats on the back wall of this space, there's a layer of mineral wool. What this does is it makes that back wall acoustically absorbing so that there are no strong reflections from behind that can be distracting. This picture also shows the bleacher seating in this space. So the reverberation time has to be controlled in other spaces as well. It's not just the music spaces. Um, this is the dance studio where we use some acoustic panels on the ceiling to control the reverberation. Um, and also the stairwell over here. So the stairwell is more or less as you walk into the building. So that's where you'll get lots of people who are milling about as they're coming or going from whatever activities. And there's the potential with so many people there that um, you can create quite, quite, quite a high reverberant sound pressure level. So to control that, we had acoustic ceiling um, on each level, which did a very good job at controlling this. Um, if I go to the next one. So the stairwell is actually just over here, and it's right next to the cafe. So this is actually quite important also, because you wouldn't want sort of a loud, reverberant level right next to the cafe, where it could be distracting and um, difficult for people here to have their coffee and chat, whatever they're doing there. Um, so prior to handover, we were able to get in and do a few acoustic measurements of the reverberation time and the ambient noise level. And we were very pleased that, to record that the measurements agreed with what we'd calculated from the design two years earlier. 
In July, there was a very successful two-week opening festival um, that received a lot of positive feedback. Um, I looked at the program online a few days ago, actually, just to see what, um, how things were going, and it's pretty full in the lead up to Christmas. Some of the activities planned include, um, there's a circus skills workshop, a Photoshop club, um, workshops on poetry, writing, um, writing rap, there's even a locking, popping, and hip hop dance class. So there's really a massive, massive range of things happening, which is great. Um, a few weeks ago, also, a few colleagues and I went to see a show that was open to the public. So the majority of the things that are happening here are for the 13 to 19 year olds, but they do have some sort of general public shows. We didn't let on that we were involved in the design of the building, and we were very impressed with the way that we were welcomed by a bunch of the young people working there, and they were really making it their own. Um, the performance itself was fantastic. The speech was very clear, um, which is, you, when you have a bunch of ac acousticians going to watch a show, of course, we're all tr being a little bit critical and looking for things that might not be quite right, but you know, it was fantastic. I think at each pause, all, between um, dialogue, we were all sitting there listening, trying to hear if we could, you know, the rumble of the, the services or any noise from outside or anything like that. We couldn't hear a thing, which is, you know, fantastic. <laughs> um, and there wasn't really, there's one or two songs in this, this performance, there wasn't much, but the, the song sounded quite beautiful also, it was very nice. So overall, all were very proud of our first Ramble Acoustics project. And I would recommend attending any of the events that are open to the public if you're ever in the area. Um, thank you very much.